Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to give people a little time to continue to join. But in the meantime, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping while people are getting onto the phone. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of this webinar. So um, make sure to type your questions into the question box if you have any, any, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Everyone except for our presenters is muted. So that's why we need the question box. And um, we will be recording this webinar so that if for some reason you want to refer back to anything or if you want to give information to anyone else um, or you need to drop off, you'll be able to get to this uh, at a later time. We'll have the slides and a recording of, of the webinar up on our website um, by tomorrow. Uh, it won't be too long. You might even be able to get it up today. So again, if you have questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, if you don't see the chat box, you may need to click on the little orange arrow that should be in the upper right of your screen, and then the uh, dashboard will appear, and you'll be able to uh, type questions into the chat box. So I am going to turn over um, the webinar to Chris McKay-Hill here in our office. He is going to give a little introduction and um, uh, introduce our speakers. And then um, at the end, we'll be taking questions. OK, Chris, you should be able to go ahead and uh, change the slides. All right. Uh, yeah, this is Chris McCahill. Uh, I am the deputy director here at uh, SSTI. Um, and today, as you probably all know, um, we're going to be talking about transportation project prioritization. Um, and here are some lessons from the work that's been done in Virginia and Hawaii. Uh, today, we've got some great speakers. Um, we've got Chad Tucker uh, joining us from the Virginia Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment. He is the Smart Scale Program Manager and has not been involved in that program uh, for a number of years now. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Ed Sniffen, um, who's the deputy director of the highway division, was uh, supposed to be joining us today. But as is often the case, um, he got pulled away to deal with some other things. So um, we'll be having uh, Marshall, uh, Marshall Ando join us instead, uh, who is a, a highways administrator for the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Um, first, uh, just a little introduction to SSTI for anyone on the phone who is uh, new uh, to our work. Um, we are a network of reform-oriented state DOTs. We're operated uh, jointly by the University of Wisconsin and Smart Growth America. Uh, our main headquarters are in Madison at the University of Wisconsin. Um, we've been operating since 2010, uh, and we operate mainly in three ways. Uh, first, as an executive level community of practice, where we um, bring together the heads of uh, state DOTs um, from across the country about once a year uh, for a day and a half meeting um, to discuss uh, issues they're trying to work through. Um, secondly, as a uh, provider of technical assistance um, to state DOTs uh, and um, so a lot of our work, um, technical assistance with agencies, is, is uh, what led us um, to work with folks like um, the Virginia and Hawaii Dep Departments of Transportation. And thirdly, as a resource for the transportation community. So we uh, sometimes put out research papers and white papers, and we put on um, presentations like uh, the webinar today. Uh, so we're, Today we're going to be talking obviously about project prioritization um, and this is kind of at the core of, of something that uh, a lot of DOTs are trying to work through today. Um, 
trying to tackle this issue where um, many of them have um, established goals that they're trying to achieve, um, ranging from accessibility and safety to economic development, cost effectiveness, um, and they're trying to link uh, these goals. Uh, I'm gonna pause a second while we work through. Uh, okay, I think we're gonna continue on. Um, and try and connect these goals uh, to the outcomes they're trying to achieve. Um, and this is an area that we work a lot with these agencies on. Uh, a lot of this has to do with um, simple policies and design standards, um, and, but also project prioritization is a big part of this. So how do we connect um, the goals that we've established um, to the things that we build, uh, operate, and maintain? Um, DOTs are obviously delivering a lot of projects um, and have methods in place for figuring out how they're going to spend their money in the most cost-effective ways. Um, and these methods range from very informal to formal. Um, oftentimes, these processes are largely legislative, um, where bodies of government are, are to some extent picking projects. Um, often it depends on, um, you know, folks have had big projects on the books for a long time. Um, and uh, wait for the funding opportunities to come along to finally fund those projects. Um, and often it, it favors um, larger infrastructure projects. Um, so a lot of what agencies are dealing with is a lot of uh, new needs. Um, so this ranges from operating existing infrastructure um, in the most efficient way, preserving in existing infrastructure um, through maintenance, um, making multimodal investments, uh, so not just investing in highways and transit, but also in many cases, bike and pedestrian infrastructure, and oftentimes um, smaller projects um, than they're used to thinking about as state DOTs, uh, achieving environmental goals. Uh, and so uh, they need to ensure that the projects that they're choosing are meeting those needs. Um, you're gonna hear from Virginia today, um, where the state more or less handed over the process to VDOT. Um, and, and said, um, we're going to establish some data-driven, uh, transparent approaches to, to prioritizing how those investments are made. Um, others, agencies may not have complete control over choosing the projects, but uh, they can do internal prioritization uh, and make recommendations for what should be funded. These programs can take a lot of work um, on behalf of staff and the leadership in these agencies. Um, they can take a lot of new um, data data sources and data management. Um, but what I think uh, agencies that are that are starting to tackle this are finding that um, it helps them achieve much better outcomes. Uh, so another thing I just want to talk about briefly is sort of the big picture um, in advancing this, this practice from SSTI's perspective. Um, we started uh, thinking about project prioritization some years ago. Um, we had a, a webinar with um, MTC in the Bay Area um, about their prioritization process uh, around 20, in around 2014. Um, we looked at that and that was about the same time that um, the Virginia, that Virginia passed their prioritization process called Smart Scale. Um, so that's been through about uh, three rounds now. Um, so you're going to hear from Chad Tucker about their experiences um, and more recently, uh, Smart Track in Hawaii DOT, which kicked off a pilot just last year. Um, so you'll hear uh, about um, some of their experiences. Um, but I just wanted to mention to folks that SSTI and some other researchers here at UW um, are launching a study on this, on project prioritization over the next 18 months. So we're gonna be looking at some standards and best practices for developing prioritization processes, um, looking at what are useful metrics uh, that can be used for, for this, and also looking at what are some of the outcomes from existing programs like SmartScale. Um, so we're looking on, on uh, working on putting together uh, a panel of um, interested agencies, uh, potentially some advisors on this project. So if you uh, are from an agency, um, either state level or MPO, um, that is working through some of these prioritization issues, um, please reach out to me um, and we can um, put you on the list to see if um, you can become engaged in this effort somehow. So that's it, um, and with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Chad, um, who's gonna tell us a little bit about SmartScale. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, as Chris pointed out, my name is Chad Tucker. Uh, I've worked with the SmartScale program pretty much from the beginning when uh, 
the state legislature passed a bill essentially directing um, the Commonwealth Transportation Board here in Virginia, who is... Chad, you should be able to click, click on your slide to take control, I think. All right, excellent. So um, I wanted to give you everybody a little bit of background on like how smart scale came to pass. And um, in Virginia, as I think in a lot of other states, there is a, a transfer a board that's appointed by the governor who who is responsible for allocating transportation dollars. And essentially a bipartisan effort uh, began back in 2014. Uh, and it was championed by a Democratic governor and a Republican speaker of the, the House of Representatives and um, really decided that the way transportation decisions were happening in Virginia was very inefficient and that there needed to be a more objective and data-driven way to uh, inform those decisions. And so essentially um, the bill required the board to use objective measures and to uh, score projects related to their cost and that took after that bill was passed it took us about 16 months to develop uh, the process there was quite a bit of outreach with localities regional planning organizations uh, to get feedback on the different measures on how we weighted things and um, essentially uh, was adopted in June of, of 2015. Now, one thing that was um, really, or several things that were key to political support, in, in our opinion, is it was a broad-based sort of evaluation. So there wasn't just one sort of factor area that was driving scores. Um, and, and I'll get into the factor areas a little bit in a little bit more detail, but we're looking at a sort of a broad list of various things that transportation projects do, improve congestion, uh, improve safety, support economic development. Um, there was also a recognition very early on that different parts of the state have very different needs. And I think that's consistent with a lot of other states. You know, it's not a homogeneous um, uh, land mass, there are lots of different communities, there's more small towns, there's rural communities, there's larger metropolitan areas, super large metropolitan areas. Um, so the process needed to recognize those differences in the different communities. Uh, another early decision was it needed to be mode neutral. Um, we know that, you know, some other states will will sort of bucket out you know these are the highway projects and this is the highway money and we're going to have a process specific to those projects versus bus transit but in virginia um, there was a strong desire that all the modes compete you know in in one process um, another key was that anything that was already fully funded this this new process wasn't going to impact so we were going to continue moving forward with any projects that already were fully funded in the process. And then there was a lot of emphasis on transparency, transparency in the process, uh, transparency in the decisions that we make, uh, transparency in the way scores are released. So decision makers don't see the scores before the public. Everybody sees everything at the exact same time. Because um, we felt like that transparency was really paramount to people trusting you know, what we were doing. And then just make sure we deliver. Um, that once these projects are funded, that we're getting the projects implemented very quickly and very efficiently. Uh, and there was another policy around the same time that I think is, you know, has gone really hand in glove with smart scale, which is the decision to fully fund projects within the six year window. Even if that project isn't starting until year five, the project will show the full amount of money. Uh, and that allows projects to accelerate a lot quicker um, there's a understanding that the money is going to be there and is, you know, uh, as many other states have probably experienced in the past, that was not the case. And I think was one of the reasons why smart scale legislation came to be is our six year program had kind of turned into a 20 year program or a 25 year program. We were heavily over programmed. Uh, it would take 20 or 25 years of money to complete everything that was in the uh, that we had allocations on it just was a horribly inefficient way of doing business. Um, 
and then getting into the mechanics of how Virginia's process works, uh, one thing that was pretty amazing from my perspective was the General Assembly was very broad. They they outlined a general framework, but did not, as can happen many times in legislation, did not specify specific methods or measures. They essentially outlined these six factor areas that projects needed to be evaluated based on. Uh, safety, congestion mitigation, accessibility, environmental quality, economic development, and land use and transportation coordination. And that was pretty much it. They didn't say how we did it, uh, what measures we should use. So the staff um, at VDOT and the RPT and with the Secretary's off, the trans Secretary of Transportation's office pretty much were able to look at what is the best what are the best ways or what are different ways that we can measure um, performance in these areas and it gave us a lot of latitude to um, I think develop a, a an outcome based process um, as opposed to had the General Assembly decided to, to legislate specific measures um, so some of the guiding principles when we were developing the measures for each of those factor areas was you know, let's analyze what matters to people and what has an impact. Um, so for congestion, for example, people care about delay. They want to reduce delay. They want to get to their destination quicker. That means something uh, as opposed to, you know, an obscure uh, measure that may not like level service that is, is tough to, to explain. Um, look at benefit, benefits relative cost. This is, I think, a one of the better decisions we made because it definitely gives an incentive to being cost effective in coming up with the solutions. In the past, I felt uh, from my observations of seeing the six-year program cycle unfold each year that a lot of success was how much bacon you brought back to your community. Um, and there was little incentive to come up with cost-effective solutions. It was more how much money can, can we get uh, the state to allocate to this transportation improvement. Um, so that benefit relative to cost, I think, was a huge, um, a hugely beneficial policy decision uh, that we made fairly early on. You know, make things transparent and easy to understand. It's got to work in both urban and rural areas. It's got to work for all modes. And we tried to the best of our ability to minimize any overlap um, but you know amongst the different measures <clears throat> so some of the goals that guided us um, in each factor area and what you'll see here the common theme is the focus on the outcome so for safety instead of how many crashes are there and how many fatalities it's instead how is the project going to reduce how do we anticipate the project is going to reduce or forecast the project is going to reduce the number of fatalities and severe injuries uh, for congestion as opposed to just the total hours of delay in the project area it's how is the project going to reduce you know how do we forecast the project is going to reduce those hours of delay and increase the throughput so the theme you're seeing here is the outcome based measures as opposed to quantifying the size of the problem, which we had, you know, had used in the past. You know, this area's got a lot of congestion. Well, you may have a project that's not really going to do anything about that. You can put cameras up in a very congested area, and the cameras are going to tell you or show you that the area is congested, but they by themselves are not going to do anything about the congestion. Um, so each of these areas you can see here are really focused on that outcome um, that we anticipate the project is going to bring to bear. How's the project going to improve air quality or support transportation efficient land use pattern, patterns? Um, and then how we score, it is, I will admit freely, it's a pretty massive effort that we go through every two years. Um, I would say in the order of hundreds of staff that are working on this for, you know, eight to 12 months as far as reviewing applications and cost estimates and validating the applications, but also on the scoring side, we tend to break the measures down into teams, various teams. It's led centrally in the central office with regular communication 
with um, various divisions within the central office as well as uh, with district staff who are working directly with the applicants. Um, we do embed consultants and have consultants brought you know, in-house during the height of the scoring season. <clears throat> and they're helping both the scoring but also assisting us with some of the QAQC uh, reviews. And um, you know, that's all, all that, that whole effort occur, unfolds over about a six month uh, window. And then in you know, January um, of the following year is when we present the results to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. And that informs their decision. I don't, and I'll say it does guide probably 90 to 95% of the projects they select, but they do still retain the authority to deviate from the staff recommended funding scenario for various reasons. You know, there may be a, a subsequent phase of a multi phase project that they want to complete to get that project, um, you know, completed in totality. So the board does have discretion. Uh, they just have to own that decision publicly and, and explain why they want to deviate. Um, so again, going back to that, that transparency uh, in the process. So how scoring works, uh, this is another, I guess, key component we feel of how our process works, is essentially for each of the measures, each project is, is compared against whoever, whichever project is the best in that particular category. So let's pretend this is hours of delay reduction. Project E has 500. It's the highest, the highest project with the highest measure value. It's going to get 100 points, and then everybody else is going to be prorated based on its percentage of the highest value. Um, so that all the scores that are used in the scoring will range from zero to 100. Um, with the best project getting the maximum points. Um, the next step is going to be how we weight things. So, for example, category A or area type A that you see here in this table below the map, those are going to be, that's going to be Northern Virginia, Fredericksburg, and Hampton Roads. Those are the more urbanized areas in Virginia. And as such, those communities have decided to put a premium on congestion mitigation. That's the most important thing that drives project selection in those areas. Um, conversely, the light blue areas of the state are your more rural ports, portions of the state. And what drives transportation decision making in those areas is more economic development and safety. So this area type weighting really allowed the process to sort of reflect the the goals and values of the different communities and diverse communities throughout Virginia. Um, this is an example of one of our scorecards. So you can see the various measure values there. Um, and then the normalized measure value, which is going to be the zero to 100. Um, and so for example, if you look at under the economic development, which is the, the darker blue, under travel time reliability, which is the third measure there, you can see this project got a 20.2, which tells me that project scored 20% of the highest value for that particular measure. Um, and as you follow things down, we have weights for individual measures within the factor area. So going back to the left over to congestion mitigation, Throughput is 50% of the score and delay is 50% of the score. And that's consistent across the different area types. Um, so we apply those percentages to the, the normalized measure value above. We sum them together, which gives us the factor score unweighted. And then we apply the factor weight. This happens to be an area type B example and congestion is weighted at 15%. So we'll then apply that 15% to each or apply that weight to each of the factor areas and then sum the value. Uh, and then what we do, that's the project benefit points. And then we divide that by the cost. So we take the cost, we divide the cost by 10 million. Uh, and that just gives us numbers in the end that aren't decimal dust. Uh, and then you essentially get a smart scale score of 7.6 for this particular example. Uh, and that would be the score that we use to develop the staff recommended funding scenario 
based on how much money is available for that particular round. Um, so again, I you know pointed out that that benefit points is divided by the the amount of money that the locality or the region is requesting. And again, this is another I think very uh, key decision that was made is this does encourage localities and regions to leverage funding as opposed to us just dividing by the total project cost. Um, they're able to essentially leverage money and reduce their request in order to um, improve their smart scale score. And there has been a significant amount of money that's been leveraged since round one in this process. Uh, here's just uh, this slide, just kind of a breakdown of the total number of projects that have been submitted and evaluated um, each round and the amount of money that was available in each round. So you'll see the the number of applications there on the top row has been going up, um, but the amount of funding on the bottom row has been going down. So in the first round, when we had 321 projects, we had $1.4 billion that was available for, you know, to compete for. Uh, fast forward to this most recent round, we finished up, we had 468 applications competing for about half the, that amount of money, for about $780 million. So um, more losers uh, because you had more applications and you had less money. Um, so this has been a, you know, a little bit of a challenge around from that standpoint. Um, and you know we're moving forward and prep you know prepping for the for the next round um, and that's a point I, I guess I w wanted to make sure to make we, the process in Virginia hasn't stayed static from round to round we always do a post sort of a post-mortem if you will uh, a post round assessment we determine what things worked you know what things look weird and we're not afraid to go back to the board as we have many times and said, hey, this measure didn't really work. Here's the reasons why. This is what we want to do to fix it. Um, some key elements, takeaways before I, you know, um, wrap up here. The state cannot submit project applications in smart scale. And at first there was a lot of pushback. And, and believe me, I was one of the ones pushing back because uh, at the time I worked for the Virginia Department of Transportation. Um, but it was the right decision in that it ensures that there's local and regional support for proposed improvements. There have been several examples in the past where projects had been pushed on a region that didn't want the project, and the project ultimately ended up not going forward and a lot of money was wasted as a result. And so I think this, this was a very astute policy decision that was made to say there's no, re we've got over overwhelming need there's no reason for us to push a project that the locality or the region doesn't want because we have plenty of other projects to, to focus on. Um, I think being mode neutral puts all the modes on the same level playing ground. There's no set-asides or carve-outs. Um, reiterate the point I've made before, not measuring the size of the problem, but what is the benefit the public's gonna see from the project? So that focus on the anticipated outcome I will be the first to admit it makes it a lot harder to do that because you have to have methods and tools and analysts to be able to do that. And that's a lot more difficult to do that than to just say this is how many hours of delay there are. Um, and then I think that decision that the benefit be divided by the cost really has encouraged um, common sense engineering, value engineering on behalf of projects. Uh, we see applicants being much more willing to pare the project down to really focus on the problem as opposed to, you know, sort of gold plating it, if you will, because the state's going to pay for it. Um, and then this, this is my last slide. This is just um, various hyperlinks to the Smart Scale website. The technical guide has a lot more detail and information on our policies and measures. Uh, the round three detailed scoring sheet you might find interesting as far as one of the, the things for transparency that we provide that show the various measures that we calculated and all the math that you can follow up to the actual score. And then we did, we do use a portal, a web portal to accept applications from the localities um, 
we found it to be a really helpful tool to facilitate collaboration, you know, earlier in the application process as a way, as opposed to, you know, getting paper copies uh, at an application deadline, because we can actually communicate with applicants through the portal. Uh, and all the documents related to that project, sketches, studies and all can be uploaded and associated with that particular application. So it makes the analysis a lot easier as well. And that's pretty much a, as quick of an overview as I can give everyone on, on how our process works here in Virginia. All right, thanks, Chad. Sorry about that. We were just working through some technical issues over here. Um, thank you again for that um, overview. Um, I know it is hard to do it all in about 15 minutes. I think you did great. Just a reminder um, in between here that if folks do have questions, um, you can type them into the chat, book, chat box. We're seeing them come in, so go ahead and add them to the list. Um, and next, uh, turning things over uh, to Marshall Ando from Hawaii DOT. Um, and if you click on the screen, Marshall, you should be able to um, take control of the slides. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Marshall Ando again from uh, Hawaii DOT. I'm the administrator for the Highways Division. Um, Deputy Director Ed Sniffen sends his uh, apologies for not being able to make it, but he did get called away um, by the governor's office. So. Um, I'm basically going to be doing this presentation um, and talking about the, um, our use of smart track. Um, basically, you know, we we're just getting started on smart track. Um, we we did a couple of things so far. It's still ongoing in terms of developing. Um, sorry, back up one. Okay, so you know, overall, um, we we thought um, Smart Track was an excellent tool to help us to begin to prioritize um, how we expend our funds. And I'm sure, like um, many other states, you know, the um, our needs uh, really exceed or outweigh our uh, available resources and funding. And so we needed to find a way to uh, really prioritize how we take care of our roadways and, and how we expend the monies and funding that we have. Um, the, um, the other um, thing about Smart Track and wanting to use this is we also want to find a way that um, makes, helps us to prioritize and make decisions, um, funding kind of decisions based on data. Um, and we wanted to ensure that we are being transparent to the public and the community so that they are able to understand how we expend our funds and prioritize money. Okay, so. Okay, so. Currently, oh, <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so our current expenditures, um, based on our priorities of um, pres uh, system preservation, safety, congestion, and resiliency, we're currently spending about 50 million per year on uh, pavement, 40 million per year on bridges. Uh, 15 for safety, 15 for congestion, and about 5 million for re resiliency. <clears throat> um, primarily focused on shoreline erosion and, and uh, rockfall kind of mitigation. Um, the, the, these dollar amounts uh, really fall short of what we really think is needed to be able to uh, maintain our system in a state of good repair. And so what we estimate to be ideal uh, in terms of funding amounts um, are, you can see on the right side of the slide, 270 million 
uh, for preservation type projects, 50 for safety, 50 for congestion, and and we're still um, trying to work through what determine trying to work through determining what the real needs are for resiliency. Um, but so <clears throat> you know that totals up to 370 million um, plus the resili resiliency cost. Um, so currently our revenues based on uh, taxes that we uh, take in, um, about one third is generated from fuel, fuel tax, one third from registration uh, fees, and then about a third from um, vehicle weight taxes. And um, you know, our, the, the buying power of the dollar is always going down. And so um, if, if we don't raise or if we're not able to raise our taxes, then really our, our revenue uh, as we go forward um, is we're able to not do as much <clears throat> as we could do today in going into the future. Um, so we, so um, what we, we see our um, revenues going down in the future. And so what we're also looking at uh, concurrently is a state uh, road usage charge. And we're currently doing a study uh, on a road usage charge based on miles traveled on the roadway. Uh, we think that that would be a more sustainable funding source um, as well as uh, a fair one to, it, to all the users of the roadway, um, especially with you know the increasing uh, usage and uh, and market on the um, electric vehicles. Um, as you know, electric vehicles, you charge them up using electricity and they, they don't go to the gas station. So we're losing out on any kind of uh, fuel taxes uh, from that perspective. So um, right now, <clears throat> these, are <clears throat> these are our priorities. Um, again, it's safety, system preservation. Um, we also need to be able to provide access to jobs and, and um, necessities for families. Um, we have a lot of congestion, and so we, we need to be able to reduce congestion, and then also to um, protect the environment and the cultural assets as well. Um, just wanna say that these are today's priorities, and um, as we're able to to um, get our, our roadways in in uh, better condition, wh wh whether it's uh, in good or fair condition, um, these priorities will be changing in the future. So this is really kind of like a living um, priorities, if you could say that. Um, so as, as we're able to accomplish more of our needs, our priorities will probably change. Okay, so um, you know we we started um, maybe close to a year ago on this smart track and um, trying to develop it for our needs. Um, we've been able to do one run through um, our projects that are on the 2019 to 2022 step. Um, so we did a run based on five different criteria, um, being uh, environmental and cultural protection. Um, traffic reduction, access, and um, preservation, um, you know, based on the priorities that I just mentioned. So we did a run uh, as a trial to see what kind of scores would come out, um, how the ranking of the projects that are, were on the STIP would come out. Um, we took that and basically uh, presented it to our Substack committee, which is uh, statewide, you know, a group of planners um, from various agent, government agencies, and we solicited comments and input from from this group. Um, and basically, you know, what the group the, there was consensus from the group that uh, there needed to be more emphasis or 
the weights of safety and system preservation needed to be increased because the, the prioritization and the ranking of the projects didn't come out as we, we really fully expected. So we're currently going through um, a second round with adjustments made to the weighting and the criteria. Um, and, and we haven't come out with a overall ranking at this point yet, but so that effort is ongoing. Um, so what we consider uh, as projects for eligibility that um, agencies uh, could apply for are, are these five types of projects. Um, and of course, again, you know, all of them will be evaluated and rated based on um, the priorities. And so this is a list of criteria that we are using um, to evaluate and score the projects that are submitted. Uh, in parentheses, after almost every item, uh, you see how much points were assigned to each, each criteria. Um, it, it's based on a 100-point system. <clears throat> and as you can see, some of the items, um, we don't have points assigned to them, and the reason for that is because we are going through this second round of um, scoring of the projects based on the comments that we had received. And so we're making adjustments as we, we move along, uh, and, and that's why we don't show the points at this, at this time for those particular items. Um, here you can see um, on the right side that photograph uh, mounted to a, the back of that vehicle is the laser crack measuring system. And it's a, um, and there's a LIDAR system on there as well. Um, but with this equipment, we're able to take measurements uh, and locations of cracks on the pavement, um, how wide they are, how deep they are, and that'll help, that kind of information and data will help us to um, determine what kind of strategies we would use to preserve the pavement um, or extend the life. Um, and we're, you know, we're really trying to expand our funds and, and operate the system as efficient as possible. And, and this is the way, so we see using data like this as a means of being as efficient as possible. And, um, oh, okay, so at, oh, I'm sorry. So, okay, the, the other photo at the bottom left side is just uh, an example of what the, um, the laser crack measuring, measuring system um, puts out in terms of uh, information on of the cracks on the roadway. <clears throat> okay, and I, as I mentioned um, earlier, you know we want to be as transparent as possible. We want to ensure that <clears throat> um, whether it's legislators or elected officials and, and really the community um, understand how we're expending our funds, um, how we're prioritizing uh, projects and what projects to do. Um, you know, we, we see that this smart track system will help us provide the transparency to be able to tell our story. Um, here you see an example of the, the newspaper article, um, Ige, which is our governor, kills highway expansion. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, the media's side of the story, we want to be able to tell our side of the story um, and in terms of how we make decisions, where we spend our money, and how we prioritize things. So it's, it's a lot about transparency. Um, on the, the bottom picture uh, with the island shown there, that's uh, just a snapshot of our website. Uh, 
um, it's a project status map and it's kind of interactive where you um, can zoom in on any location on any island and there'll be um, you can click on various uh, routes and roadways to see what projects are on there, um, what the status of the projects are, um, what the cost is. Okay, so, um, you know, we've, as I mentioned earlier, we've gone through one run of um, project scoring, project ranking. Uh, we're making adjustments and tweaks to the criteria and the weighting. Uh, we're, we're doing a second run of the same list of projects, um, and, and we'll, you know, see how that comes out. Um, but it's looking like it, it's pretty consistent with what we thought, and so really there's a, um, a lot of validation and confidence that we're having what we're seeing um, with Smart Track, and, and I think we're on the right track. Um, but so what we also see is that the, the ranking and prioritization that comes out of uh, the scoring of this project and using this tool is just the beginning. And it's just the beginning to start the discussions with community, with um, you know, elected officials. Uh, and, and from there, we can see what adjustments can and should be made uh, to projects that we implement. So with that, um, I think that takes care of all the slides that we have. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, that was great. And thank you again for being able to fill in um, at the last minute like you did. Um, I should acknowledge both of our speakers for um, being flexible. And as you can imagine, it can be hard to find time that um, both Virginia and Hawaii can be on the phone at the same time. So. Um, we appreciate everybody is being able to do that. Uh, just a reminder um, that if you do have questions, um, feel free to still type them in into the question box um, and we'll see if we can get to them. Um, I'm just gonna start with um, some that we have already um, and uh, sort of turn things back to Virginia just to start. Um, a couple questions here um, that I'll just, I'll just lump together. Um, one being um, how long did it develop, how long did it take to develop the smart scale system from the time that the legislation was passed to the time that you started scoring. Um, and then maybe related to that, um, how much effort does it take um, on behalf of the agency to go through this scoring process? Uh, I think it was about 16 months from when the bill was adopted to us having a process, the board adopt a process and we started you know, implementing it. So um, about a year and a half of, of actual <clears throat> development work. And that included a lot of literature review of what other states and MPOs, we actually flew some folks in to do sort of a peer exchange for some areas that seemed to be sort of leaders in this area of prioritization. Um, and lots of public meetings, lots of outreach throughout the entire state to make sure that we were, you know, soliciting input from the stakeholders who ultimately would be submitting applications. Uh, and I think that while it was hard and it took a while, it was, you know, it was time well spent because I think in the end we had a pretty good amount of buy-in to the process. Um, now, as, as far as implementation, um, in the first round, it was very, um, I don't want to say bubblegum and bail and wire, but it was, we used a lot of Excel spreadsheets to do a lot of our calculations. Um, and it was not the most efficient thing. I mean, it worked, but immediately after round one, there was a pretty large scale effort that, hey, we need a proper database. We need to try to get away from these individual spreadsheets and, you know, get things into tables and views that, are a little bit more flexible, uh, a little bit more secure. Um, so a pretty good amount of effort has gone into that from round to round. It just improved the tools that we use. Um, and then as far as, I guess, staff effort, you know, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's a pretty, um, our, our secretary at the time did not want a process that localities and, and MPOs had to hire consultants to submit an application. 
so in doing that, that meant there was an expectation the state was going to assist applicants as needed. And that included doing studies, developing cost estimates, you know, really, really holding folks hand if they needed the help um, to get their projects ready. So you've got that side of it, of all the staff in the field and the districts that are assisting applicants in, in the six, you know, three, four, five, six months leading up to the application intake to get the projects ready. Um, and then, you know, a pretty sizable team. I would say this last round, just for congestion alone, we had probably <clears throat> 35 people working for six months just to do the congestion measures. Um, and that, that was a combination of in-house staff as well as embedded consultants that we brought on board. So it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty significant time commitment um, and resource commitment, but we're talking about, you know, a process that's determining the expenditure of, you know, ten, hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, in the end, we feel it's a worthwhile, um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a worthwhile investment. Uh, thanks. Um, I have a related question that, that Chad, you just alluded to a little bit, but I wonder if um, there are similar experiences in Hawaii. Um, you kind of suggested that you didn't want to make the, the application process um, too, too, much, too much more onerous. Um, for, for either of you, maybe starting with Marshall, has this led to any changes in the application process or do you see a need for changes in the application process? Um, so from our perspective, um, you know, we, prior to um, using this tool, we had sort of a, an internal application process um, that our various, you know, programs would use to uh, identify the needs or priorities of, of their uh, respective program for projects. And so we took that that form, and we call it a project programming uh, report or request. Um, and it basically, you, you fill it in with project information and, and justification on the need, um, cost, and, and other typical kind of project information. And so we use that, and we kind of um, uh, enhanced it and incorporated, you know, the, the priorities that we had set out with and the uh, criteria and so that's what we have today um, and that's what was used in the past and um, through this experience of of the first application of projects and ranking and scoring what we found is that um, there's there's a difference in how um, people or agencies interpret the information that's being requested. And so um, we need to make adjustments and, and really I think we need to um, better define what information we are looking for in order to help us score and rank the projects uh, with a little more ease. Um, we On the first round, we got all kinds of information um, that were related or not related some were factual, some were, um, you know, not factual. And so it makes it difficult to evaluate what the applicant is trying to get across to us in terms of their need and the justification. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about smart scale and how transit fits into the picture. Um, uh, how does transit tend to perform? Um, what is scoring transit been like um, for you? And I'll just add that I know that, that SmartScale is fully multimodal, so it's it's not just highways and transit that are in there. Um, mm -hmm. Chad, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, actually transit is, has done extremely well. Um, I think it has one of the higher, if not the highest, success rate as, as a percentage of the application submitted. Um, so transit does do, um, really well and I guess how we approach transit is and again our methods because we're doing hundreds of projects in a you know a matter of months we we got a 
scale our methods, if you will, accordingly. Um, but for like congestion, in a, in a highway scenario, you're, you know, everybody's familiar with volume to capacity ratio. We're essentially doing a volume delay function and we're increasing the C. We're saying the capacity for this the road widening project is going to increase the C, the V over C ratio goes down, the before speeds compared to the after speed, the number of vehicles, and that's how we sort of back into personnel is the delay reduction. On the transit side, we're essentially modifying the V. We're saying the, these, this bus service is going to, based on its anticipated ridership, and so we're working with our, um, you know, our partner agency over at the Department of Rail and Public Transportation. They're working with the applicant to develop uh, or, or get the, the ridership estimates, and then we're translating that essentially into a volume, a reduction in vehicular volume to get our before and after. And then on the crash side, you know, highways, we're doing, we're applying CMFs based on what the project's doing, uh, the crash modification factors. On the transit side, really the VMT reduction is the CMF. So if there's going to be a 10% or a 5% VMT reduction on that facility, we'll assume a 5 or 10%, whatever that VMT reduction is, in crashes as a result of the volume reduction. So again, very sort of high level, but it's something we can defend and it's something we can do consistently from one project to the next. But transit actually has done, I, I feel, has done really well, um, is actually getting a, um, a really fair shake in the process. And we have certainly have not heard any complaints from the transit community um, due to the number of projects that have been funded. Uh, thanks. Um, I've got a few questions that might be too technical. I think we're just going to try and squeeze in one last question. I'll, I'll kind of put two together. This is also for Chad. Um, so in this whole process, uh, you mentioned that VDOT can't submit projects. So how does, um, what role do, does VDOT play, in, if they do, in sort of um, putting forward priorities and things like that? And um, if you can also speak to um, the role that MPOs might play in this too. Okay. So in MPO areas, I know one thing that happened in round one, because that was the first round and we were kind of still the loosest from a rule standpoint, is we had a number of projects that were submitted by localities within MPO areas that were not in the CLRP. And granted, the projects get funded by the state, now the, the, the MPOs are having to go back and amend their CLRPs. And we heard complaints about that, rightfully so, like, hey, we've gone through this deliberate process with the state being a voting member of the MPO, you know. And so we modified our policy to say, if you're submitting a project that's not on the CLRP, you've got to get a resolution of support from the MPO. So those are where, I guess, some adjustments, um, you know, uh, came, came into play and in that we wanted to respect the authority of the MPO within the MPO areas. Uh, so the role of the state really is facilitating the project development and planning process and being very proactive. Um, so VDOT goes out on an annual basis with data and says these are where the safety issues are and the congestion issues are and will work with applicants to de develop studies and test alternatives and come up with you know, what, what we feel is the best alternative to put forth. So there's that sort of support role and in, in technical support to the applicant community um, helping with cost estimates uh, is another area that the district staff really helps um, the localities. So really our job is to facilitate the planning process and to be good advocates for good projects. So there are times where we'll say, we just don't feel that this is a high priority improvement. There's no congestion, there's no safety. We're going to put our limited resources over, you know, we can help you over here where there's a, an issue. but um, you know, that's really the state, the, the function of the state is to help get the projects ready that we feel are good to develop the, the multimodal plan. One thing I forgot to allude in my presentation is projects submitted have to meet a VTRANS need, and VTRANS is our statewide multimodal plan. So the state identifies the need areas, and the projects submitted have to be addressing those need areas. So that's one area where the state will screen projects out saying, hey, it doesn't meet one of our one of the needs. Uh, and then obviously in scoring, just administering 
the portal, getting the portal, keeping that running, um, you know, listening to the community, to the applicant community and the different features they want added to the portal or issues they have with the process, you know, running through the scoring, um, presenting to the board. So that's, that's sort of the role. But our, I guess our feeling when we were, when we put that policy in place was if, if the state can't convince a locality or a region that the project's important, then there's a problem. Um, and that's why we had that policy that the state, and plus optically, if the state is the one scoring the projects, should the state also be the one submitting the projects? I think it was that optical issue that people had of the state scoring its own its projects that it submitted. And if those projects do well, would people think it's because, well, that's because that's the project the state put forward. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Yes, thank you. I was familiar with some of that, but I'm sure plenty of people are not. Um, we've got a couple of questions that I just don't think we'll have time to get to. We want to respect everybody's time. Um, but thanks again for everybody who participated today. Um, one last quick reminder that we will be making the slides available and a recording of the webinar um, by tomorrow, um, if not earlier. Um, so just thanks again to everyone. Um, I think this was uh, really informative for folks and we appreciate your, your ability to, um, to join us and help answer folks' questions. So any other information, um, do visit our website, um, ssti.us. And uh, thanks.